Women Taking the Lead, Episode 13. Because when you're present in the moment, you have so much more access to your own inner guidance and you make smarter choices and you feel in control. And then I was leading my business from my heart rather than from a place of scarcity. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Your future awaits, so let's get started. everyone and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Gina Gabellini, who is a master business coach who supports conscious entrepreneurs to double and even triple their profits by leveraging attraction principles, proven strategies, and fun. Her top tier private coaching and sold out seminars have allowed committed entrepreneurs to blow past their self-imposed limits, ditch the drama of overwhelm, and move into radical joy, inner peace, and ever-increasing profits. She's the co-author of Life Lessons for Master. Mastering the Law of Attraction, which she wrote with Eva Gregory, Mark Victor Hansen, and Jack Canfield. And Gina also has two books of her own. She has 10 Minute Money Makers, How to Easily Double Your Profits in Just 10 Minutes a Day. And her newest book, which just released last month, is Rock Your Profits, Stress Free Steps That Turn Your Biz into a Badass Money Making Machine. Hallelujah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Gina, that's just a teaser for everyone. So tell us more about you and where you came from. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, So I've been a coach for 20 years and it wasn't like a planned thing. It just was something I fell into and I immediately loved it. I thought, oh my gosh, the whole entire world needs to be coached. This is great. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Even though I I had been an entrepreneur before that, I didn't really know much about business. You know, I just kind of did what I needed to do to make the amount of money that I needed to survive. And I was kind of, I was a lazy entrepreneur for sure. And then when I got into coaching and thought, well, okay, I'm just going to go out and tell the world they need to be coached and I'm going to fill my practice. And I actually did in the beginning, I was running on pure passion and it wasn't about selling people on coaching. It was really educating people on coaching. And that's what was driving me. And I instantly filled my practice and was doing pretty fairly well until I just hit a plateau. And I I noticed I was working really, really hard because there was the mentality of I'm behind. I'm not Mm -hmm. doing as much as I could. And look at all these other leaders in my industry and they're kicking butt and I'm not. And if I could just put more things into place, maybe I can do what they're doing. And I don't damn near gave myself a heart attack (laughs) at 30 years old. (laughs) And I thought, this is so not working. This is not working. And maybe it's because I'm just not organized. And I remember hiring all these different coaches, the best coaches in the world to get me out of overwhelm. And they were just giving me structures to be better organized. And it finally occurred to me that it had nothing to do with organization, why I was overwhelmed. It was my thinking. It stunk. My my stinking thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, I just had that belief that productivity equals success. And that didn't work at all. And uh, I ended up hiring a coach by chance who just said, you need, she said, let's do a trade. You need to help me with the money thing because I suck at that. And you suck at being present in the moment. And I said, you're right. I do. (laughs) (laughs) And that changed my whole world about being present in the moment. Because when you're present in the moment, you have so much more access to your own inner guidance and you make smarter choices and you feel in control. And then I was leading my business from my heart rather than from a place of scarcity. Two things you said really jumped out out at me because I'm a coach and it took me a few years to realize people didn't want to buy necessarily what I do. They wanted to buy who I was being. Like if I was being powerful and confident and calm and in control, people wanted to coach with me. It was something about they wanted to almost like have the qualities that I had. So that made perfect sense when you were talking about when you, you weren't having as much fun, it was harder to, (laughs) to find clients. And the second thing was, and I think this is very relevant for women is pushing for success. 
I find for women, a lot of the business coaches out there, um, or I should say the people who've written business books and how to be successful in business are men. And a lot of their strategies are about going hard and, you know, being working all sorts of crazy hours and push, push, push till you're successful. But that's an adrenaline model yeah, of right. success. Yeah. And it doesn't jive with women. Like we tend to exhaust ourselves and feel depleted and unhappy when we do that, whereas men get energized from it. And so when you said that, that made perfect sense for me that I found as well that women just don't, that's not how they become successful. It's not by pushing. I think it's not working for a lot of those men too, because I've coached a lot of CEOs and, you know, they're like, man, I'm multitasking at my kids, you know, baseball events. And it just feels like I can never relax. Like there's always something missing. I'm not balanced at all. And it's, it's mm. not, I don't think that model works for anybody. Mm. I love that you hit on that. So clearly, Gina, you've had success in your life and you've definitely gained some confidence. But take us back to a time when you were playing small and you may not have been aware of it, aware of it at the time. It may have been something you picked up on in retrospect. Share with us that story and the lessons you learned. So I think that a lot of times when we're playing small, we actually think we're playing big, but it's not, and it's not that we're necessarily playing small. I think it's that the, the thinking at which we're going at what we're doing is diminishing us. So there was a time, I don't know, it was about 10 years ago that I, you know, my debt started creeping up and then it exploded and I had been making six figures and I had a really bad breakup with the guy and he became a stalker and I was completely in fear and I stopped paying attention to my business. And then when I finally started paying attention, I thought, oh, I'm in deep doo-doo over here. I've got three clients. And if any one of them quits right now, I am, so I'm already in trouble, but it's going to be devastating. And I kept pushing to figure out in my head, it wasn't like I was in overdrive around action, but in my brain, I kept pushing for the answer. What's going to turn this around? How can I get more clients? Clients used to just fall on my lap. Now they're not. What do I need to do? How can I change this? Where's my creativity? It was all that pushing energy in my brain, which made me feel like a loser. First of all, my business wasn't doing good. And second, I couldn't figure out how to get out of it because I kept pushing. And my best girlfriend, Eva, Her business was doing really great at that time. And she said, you're pushing too hard to figure it out. And I said, I know, but I can't help myself. I can't stop. (laughs) It's like an addiction. I got to, you know, I got to figure this out or else I'm, you know, it's never going to change. And I'm going to have to go get a job. And I haven't had a job in 20 years. What am I going to do? And so I, I finally decided to stop the push and relax and own up to, okay, okay, let me, let me see where I really stand with this debt thing. Cause I really didn't want to look and I owned up to it and I said, okay, I'm going to take back control and taking back control means I'm going to create a spreadsheet. I'm going to put all my numbers down and see where I'm really at with this. And it was just as bad as I thought it was that somehow in that moment, I, instead of being scared to look at it, facing it head on was definitely a big girl move. And I felt relaxed. I thought, okay, so it's as bad as I thought. At least it's not worse. And uh, what do I want to do about it now? And I said, I don't know what to do, but I am on a mission to transform the way I'm thinking about this debt. And I'm going to stop pushing to figure this whole thing out. I'm going to relax. Um, I'm going to do what I know how to do. Something empowering, you know, another mission besides, you know, trying to figure out how to get more clients. So I started organizing my house. And that felt empowering. And I started giving the clients that I did have, all three of them, the best customer service I could. And all of a sudden, I felt back in control. So the smallness went away as soon as I stopped pushing. Because when you, th- you think you're being smart and you think you're playing big when you're tr- pushing for something bigger. But pushing is not big. It diminishes you because you feel out of control. That's, what you're, that's what's driving the wanting to play big at that moment when you're pushing. And how does this play itself out in your day-to-day now? This lesson. As soon as I know I'm uptight about something, I know I'm pushing for results. I'm, and when you're pushing for results, what you're really saying, what's really going on is I don't believe I'm going to get my results. That's why I think I need to push hard. So it's, I notice it immediately now and either do self coaching, call my girlfriend to get coaching, push away from the desk, go on a walk and remember that I get to have whatever I want. I don't have to push for it. And if this thing that I'm doing doesn't work out, 
there's a, a hundred million other ways to get the same end result. You know, if I'm looking to make more money, it's, if this one thing doesn't work, it doesn't mean all is lost. That's nothing to do with it. It's like, okay, so this didn't work. Something else out there will. So, but I have to get back in control of my emotions instead of reacting and thinking like, oh, all is lost. It's never going to work. <laughs> I'm doomed. <laughs> Oh, that is so funny. It's so true. When something, I love how you said you just put it into a spreadsheet and it was as bad as you suspected, but at least you knew for certain it wasn't worse than what you thought it was. It was black and white on paper and there was something you could do about it. And I loved how you also said you, you found ways to put control back in your court, even if it was unrelated to the problem, like cleaning your house technically didn't have anything to do with your money problems, but it made you feel more empowered and more confident. And like things were back in your control, which changed how you were tackling your finances. Oh, I love that. Okay. Now Gina share with us a time in your journey when you had a wake up call, take us back to that moment and share with us the steps that you took that led to your success. Well, I'd have to say that same, that wake up call was watching how when I did all that, when I was in that place of debt, that when I finally relaxed nine months later, my business bumped right back up to six figures, all the debt was gone. And it proved to me that it was about mindset. The inner game was everything. Inner game trumps any strategy you could put in place in your business. It was like, whoa. That, I cannot believe how fast that worked when I've been struggling for over a year to get it together by that pushing energy and just shifting my inner game changed it all. I thought, whoa, this is so much easier. I'm going to do this every time. So now I pay attention to inner. I, it's like I don't make a move. I don't take any. I don't do implement anything in my world until I know my head is in the right place because I know otherwise I'm just wasting my energy. Mm. And that's something you've definitely infused in your business as well, because I've kind of, you know, watched you online and, you know, from afar and your videos and seen your emails. And that's something that distinguishes you from most of the other coaches out there is you do focus on the inner game. You do do strategy, right? You have worksheets and templates and all of that, but you don't even get into that until you've talked about where are you coming from? Are you enjoying what you're doing? Is this an alignment with who you are? And I love that about you. Like it definitely, you you are your brand. Thank you. Out there. You're welcome. Mm. Okay. Now, one thing I always um, ask um, my guess is about, about their leadership style, because there's no one way to lead. And if we try too hard to lead like somebody else, we tend to get off track because it might not be completely in alignment with who we are. So Gina, how would you describe your leadership style? Mm-hmm. Casual. <laughs> <laughs> intentional. I'm very intentional about what the outcome is, but I don't it's not about rigidity, you know, being rigid. It's really about holding everybody capable around me and, you know, telling them like, I'm not, we're, co- this is all co-creation. I am definitely not the leader. I know what my preferences are. I know what I want, but I know y'all can help me get there with your, you know, honoring your own style in your own way. And I definitely mm-hmm. make sure that everybody around me is asking for what they need and playing to their strengths rather than me saying, this is how it's going to go down. And I see myself as I'm the leader of self. So no matter who else is on my team or who's you know playing with me, ultimately, I'm the, I'm the bottom line for making sure I get the results I want. Especially this goes back to, you know, I believe in our game Trump strategy. So it doesn't matter if my whole entire team screwed up. It's still my energy that's creating my results. So they always like, you know, they always feel bad if somebody screws up on something. And I I might have my moment of like, oh, my God, I cannot believe that just happened. How did that happen? Like if somebody screws up on something and I realize, you know what? In the big scheme of things, that one little thing is not going to make or break my outcome. Does it suck that that happened? Yeah, but let's move on. Like they always can't believe I don't get, you know, I don't get mad and I do get mad. I have my moment of disappointment and I get over it and I usually don't tell them, you know, they, they are always, I assume that everybody's trying to do their best Mm. and 
sometimes they are doing their best, but if we don't have a system to carry it out, it may not be that they're the breakdown. It may be that we're having a, we need a system in place. So the system's having a breakdown. So a lot of people will point at people. No, that person isn't doing their job. This person sucks at that. And it's like, "Mm, they could probably do their job a lot better if we created a system for it to work. So I'd say I'm casual only because I know it's up to me. So there's no pressure. And I don't feel like I should have to carry the whole thing. I'm a leader of my business where my business follows me. So as long as I'm a leader of self, all is well. And Gina, can you give us an example, um, something in your business where you set the intention? Like how did you communicate that? And how did it play out that people like brought their own strengths to the table to get the result that you were looking for? Well, I have to say back up. It's because... First of all, if you're really clear on the outcome you want, and I like I'm really clear the my like my first I call it my big girl launch when I did an online launch to promote one of my programs, I declared to the world this is gonna be a six figure launch, which is incredibly scary and you feel a little bit stupid, like, well what if I fail? They're all gonna know I didn't hit my mark. <laughs> um, right. but I I play so much attention to my inner game and getting in belief that I am gonna have a six figure launch, but not attached to it. You know, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't mean the world's going to come to an end. But let's see if we can let's see if we can do this. Let's go for it. Um, that my team, I make it a game, and so I ask my team to make it a game. And then anybody who's supporting me, I try to make it fun and keep it a game. I mean, my big secret is let let's all have fun. How can we create fun for ourselves? And I I hired the right people, and I play with people that I love in terms of the people who support me and promote me. So it's not even like I have to rally the troops, like, come on, we got to do this. They show up wanting to support me just because they know it's going to be an enjoyable ride. There's no, you know, I have to do something to fire you up. It's like they come like that because I hold the intention that this is going to be so much fun for everybody. They, They do want, they just, everybody wants to play. Mm, I want to play. You're talking about it. And I want to play. <laughs> <laughs> and what I heard in that too, is they're a part of the strategy as well. Like they have input on how are we going to execute this? So they have complete buy-in because it's their part. It's to a large extent, it's their ideas that they're executing. So they want it to be successful. Totally. It's like, here's how you have to show up. This is the only way we can do this. Like, how, how do you want to be? And what would excite you? And what's What's going to be your transformation in this game? Even though the, it's about supporting me, there's what's the transformation that's going to happen for them? So they each set their own goals and about what what their transformation is going to be and what's their reward. But I have to say, even before we started doing the reward system, I had full buy on buy in, and I just I feel blessed because I think my team rocks. That's awesome. And what is one thing that you're working on right now that you're really excited about? My next launch. (laughs) Care to share? (laughs) Every launch is an experiment and me mastering things that scare the you-know-whaty out of me. Mm -hmm. And so I look forward to perfecting my game and mastering it. Uh, You know, marketing is uh, a learned skill for me. It's not something I was born with. So for me, I'm always looking at how can I master my energy around it and how can I master like the the true game of marketing and get have bring heart to it because marketing is not just a set you know set strategies it's also you know bringing heart to it is what I think is what makes it makes or breaks it so I just enjoy the whole game of can I do it can I pull this off how much better can I do this time and how much fun can we have can we make it easier than last time that's always a big focus how much easier can we make it no oh, I love that I love that. And for those who are listening who might not be in the entrepreneurial world or online businesses, can you give a a quick overview of what you mean by a launch? A launch is me. I say, hey, we have a start date and we have an end date. We're going to we're going to market this program, a transformational program to whatever. It doesn't matter what field you're in. I happen to teach people how to double their profits and double their fun. So, you know, for two weeks. We're going to give away tons of free content and transformational information. And then we're going to make an offer, you know, uh, about halfway in and say, great. If you've loved all this stuff, then you're going to love this program. You have to pay for it. But now you've gotten a taste of what I do. And if you like it, come play. And so it's a it's a high energy, shortened period of time 
where you get people very excited. And even if they don't end up buying your thing, hopefully they fall in love with you and love your stuff and they'll become part of your tribe. And if they don't buy now, maybe they'll buy later. And even if they don't buy ever, hopefully they got a lot of good stuff out of it. So they have a positive experience with you. Mm. And what I, I love about that, Gina, I want to make sure everyone understands, like this is usually a high stakes time and it can make people crazy oh, yeah. when, when this is going on because you do have a short period of time to, you know, you know, get people excited to buy into your program. But what I love about what you, what you keep saying is like, how can we make this easy? How can we make this fun so that it's enjoyable through the whole process? Definitely. Because if you're having fun, you're probably going to have a good result and you don't want to be whacked out. And that's not to say that I don't stress at some point in my launch because you do. You have expectations. You're a human being. But I really enjoy the process. And, you know, you've put a lot into it. So I spend, you know, nine months brainstorming it, making it perfect. And I invest a lot of money in my team to make everything just right. And so, yeah, it's high stakes. You don't want to, you don't want to fail. That would suck. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what makes it so exciting yeah, too. Yeah. So. Like, can I pull this off? Let's see. <laughs> I love that. All right. Now I'm going to do a quick leadership roundup. So tell us, Gina, what is one practice that makes you a better leader? Hmm. Well, I think it's about the first, there's two things popped up in my brain is one going for my walks because yeah, yes. that settles my energy down and I become aware that it's not just me in my little office here. It's me out. There's a whole big, great world out there to connect to and it just calms me. So I come back a better person when I walk and um, I have a speed dial, the universe journal that I created and it's all about setting your intentions and getting grounded. And when I do that practice, life just works a whole bunch better. And to point out, leadership starts with yourself. So the better you take care of yourself and make sure you're in the right mind frame, the better you will be leading others. So that's perfect. Yeah. And what is one book that you would recommend to a woman to help her develop her leadership? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, it, it's the, the, the book that popped up in my brain is One Minute Millionaire because it's not, it's, it is about you know, making money. But the, the thing that it, it's a fable, one part of the half the book is a fable. It's a transformational story. And it's about a woman. And the other half is about how do you create that millionaire mentality. But I love it because it shows what happens when you take leadership, even if it's about something you have no idea what to do. And you surround yourself with empowering people and you say, this is what my outcome is. And you'll see how the world steps up to support you so that you can create it. I love it. I'm loving that too. What is your favorite healthy food? My favorite healthy I, lo I love brown rice. <laughs> brown rice. And do you have a favorite way that you like it prepared? No, I just like steamed brown <laughs> rice. I'll put anything on top of it and enjoy it. And by anything, give us some, some, when, and for someone says anything, I'm like, really, where, where do, what's the gamut? What are we talking about here? <laughs> we can put pineapple in it. We can put bananas on top of it. We can put chicken. We can put steamed veggies. Any kind of sauce will do. It could be mm. curry sauce. It could be teriyaki sauce. It could be barbecue sauce. I don't care. I love brown rice. I love that. Okay. So. This, this next question tends to be a little hard because part of us always wants to say, I wouldn't change anything. You know, my journey has made me who I am. Oh. So, I, so I always want to preface it. Like if you could keep the lesson, right? Knowing what you know now, if given a chance to go back and do anything differently, what would you change? Oh, my God. Uh, you don't have enough time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that popped in my brain is I would have chilled out when my second baby was born and he wasn't sleeping, I completely became a freakazoid. I pushed so hard to find a solution to get that kid to sleep. It became my sole focus in life. And I've never been so miserable and got like nothing worked. So I would, if I, the sooner I would have chilled out, the sooner I would have like, my baby would have chilled out. <laughs> it was like, Oh my God. I talk about pushing energy. I, wow. I was over the top. Like, Oh, what can I do now? And just stressing about it. It was terrible. 
Oh, there's that theme of pushing again, oh, pushing, yeah. pushing, pushing. Yeah. And yeah, you know what I'm getting, Gina, is sometimes we just have to accept things the way they are. I mean, we we'll, we can calmly go about trying to find solutions. It doesn't have to be in a state of frenzy um, and urgency. And that's something I, I definitely find myself in at times where I think if I'm all hyped up, then I'll get it done. And it's not always the case. More often than not, it kind of takes me off track and exhausts me. <laughs> Nothing good comes out of pushing. Nothing. And you are never going to find your ideal solution that way. Never. As soon as I chilled out, guess what happened? It took me a year. My son, it was all good. <laughs> and now my man, yeah, he wanted my kid to sleep. But he was just like, you know, oh, but just appreciate the fact that he's in her bed. And it's whatever. It won't last. And if I would have just done what he would have done, all would have been well. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. All right. And before we say goodbye to you, share with us a success quote or a mantra and why it has meaning for you. All is well is my thing. I say that to myself, I don't know how many times a day, all is well. Because in the big scheme of life, all really is well. And it immediately reminds me that all is well. It just puts me, it centers me. I don't know. I love that saying. Mm -hmm. I have it painted on signs. I say it. I say I just love it oh that just put me in a place of peace and I really enjoyed when I um, pulled up your Skype ID the tagline underneath it all is well and getting weller <laughs> <laughs> all right lastly Gina what is the best way for our listeners to connect with you um a fun little thing that they can do is go to map to profits.com even if you're not an entrepreneur you'll have fun with this map T O profits.com. And it's this whole, it, it kind of tells you about, you know, my journey when I tripled my income and it was all about, not about strategy. It was about inner game. So you'll see this visual map of how I did it. And then there's a visual map for you to fill out how you want to create your best year yet. And this little narrative about what happened with my inner game to have that explosive result in such a short period of time. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'll have that linked up in the show notes page. So Gina, thank you so much for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us. We're all better for having met you. Well, thank you. It was fun. It was incredible having Gina on the show. And you can find all the resources mentioned in this episode, including Gina's Map to Profits at womentakingthelead.com. Or you can use the short link, which is womentl.com, and you'll find Gina's show notes page in the podcast tab. And if you have a few moments and you're not driving, if you could head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for Women Taking the Lead, I would appreciate it. And if you're enjoying the episodes, subscribe so that that these episodes automatically download to your computer and your phone, your various devices. And give me some feedback. It gives me insight into what you like and what you would like to see more of in the show. And it also enables others to find the show more easily. Thank you all for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. And to strengthen you on your own leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. So here goes. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining me and here's to your success.